Uh, I just want to acknowledge, first of all, that I am here, um, obviously, um, because of the kindness of Woodfordia um, and Sandra for having me here on the program. But also, um, I'd like to give thanks to a little organisation called Ecolaboration. They're a not-for-profit group in Nambour, and I used to work for them and do these sorts of workshops all the time. So they're supporting me to be here today, loaning me their equipment and resources, which is really great. And I'm also here representing the Australian Citizen Science Association, which Sandra is a part of as well, um, which is a, an organisation that exists to promote um, more people to participate in citizen science and to help researchers design better citizen science projects. So just to give you a bit of an idea, so I'll just do it very briefly first. So this session right now is just a little introduction to what are water bugs and why do we go out looking for them. And then we're going to go out and catch some and have a look at them live. I'm not sure how we'll go today because they don't really like the rain they tend to, tend to hide. But fingers crossed we'll find some good ones. Um, but come back later as well at one o'clock. I'm doing a, a longer presentation going a little bit more into their characteristics and how they live and things like that. But first of all, what, what on earth are water bugs? So in the scientific community, we call them aquatic macroinvertebrates. So aquatic meaning that they spend some part of their life cycle in water or to do with water. Macro meaning, yes, they're small, but you can see them with your naked eye. And invertebrate meaning that they don't have a backbone. So let's just, first of all, list off a couple of things that we're not talking about today. Do fish have a backbone? Yeah, so when they're not a water bug, we're not studying fish today. What about frogs and tadpoles? They have a backbone, they're, they're, they're a vertebrate. We are not studying frogs and tadpoles. What are we going to have a look at? Things like snails and yabbies and worms and um, uh, things that fly like dragonflies and mayflies and, um, and some beetles as well. So, so lots of cool stuff and yes, even uh, midges and some types of sandflies as well um, uh, can be aquatic part of their, um, as part of their life cycle. So those are the things that we're looking at. So if we catch a fish, we're going to put it back. <laughs> um, so a little bit about their life cycle. So, so how much time do they spend in water and what part of their life cycle is in water? I start with butterflies. Obviously, butterflies are not, <laughs> are not aquatic. But I like to start with the life cycle of butterflies because most people are familiar with how that works. So we have the adult female. She lays eggs. And then the eggs hatch and you get a caterpillar, we call that a larva. And then the caterpillar eats and grows and grows and then eventually it reaches the stage where it's ready to, um, to build its um, cocoon. Uh, we call that the pupil stage. So when it's in that stage, it's, it's pretty much hibernating, it doesn't eat, it's not moving around, it's just in there, it's tucked away um, in a safe, safe spot and um, its body is changing, it's transforming from that larval stage into the adult and it merges and we have our adult butterfly. So most people are familiar with that cycle. So some of our water bugs have a very similar cycle to that. So for example, mosquitoes. So the adult female, she'll lay her eggs. Um, mos adult mosquitoes lay their eggs on the water surface. So they leave them floating there. And then when the eggs hatch, you get your larva. The larva is swimming around in the water. It's eating and growing. And then when it's ready, it, it goes into its pupil stage. And, um, and then from there, it emerges and you have the adult. So very similar to butterflies, but it involves water. So we call that a complete um, metamorphosis. Some of our um, water bugs have a similar life cycle, but it's just missing a step. So dragonflies, for example, the uh, adult female, she'll still, um, she'll still lay eggs, but she lays her eggs in the water, not on the surface. The eggs hatch, and then what you get um, is, we don't call it a, um, a larva, we call it a nymph. The reason why we call it a nymph is because it never goes into that hibernation stage. It, it doesn't form, um, it doesn't go through the pupil stage. The the butter, sorry, the dragonfly nymph. Every time it grows, it sheds its skin. It gets a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. Um, and then when it's ready, it climbs out of the water, sheds its outer its exoskeleton, and um, emerges as the adult. So it never goes into that um, hibernation sort of pupil stage. 
So slightly different, but you can understand very, very similar process. So a lot of the things that we're going to have a look at, like dragonflies and mayflies, um, even beetles, we think of them as terrestrial, or I've noticed a lot of people think of them as terrestrial because that's how we see them. But actually they spend most of their life in water. It's actually a very short period of time that they spend as adults out of the water and they basically just breed, they mate um, out of the water and that's it. And they spend the rest of their, their life cycle as aquatic um, creatures. So I always think it's very important to remember that, that if you love looking at dragonflies, this all relates back to you got to make sure that your creeks and streams are healthy and that water quality is clean so that you have you have more dragonflies. So where where do they live? Basically, most freshwater um, sources, um, and it doesn't have to be a, a flowing creek. It could be a pond as well. Um, so so within, uh, let's just take a creek. Within a creek, you've got lots of different types of habitats in there. So sometimes you've got these really shallow bits with lots of rocks, and as the water flows over, it creates what we call a riffle. Not a ripple, a riffle. Um, so the water is a bit churned up, but it's still quite shallow. There's a lot of oxygen in there. There's a lot of movement in there. You often find a big variety um, of our water bugs living in that sort of spot. Um, but you've got others that are not very comfortable with fast flowing water. They much prefer it where it's nice and calm and still. And so they'll be out in the, deep, in the deeper areas where the water is um, flowing a lot slower. They're in the calm, um, the pool, and you'll have some on the surface, some in the middle, some down in the bottom in the sediment. And then you have some that specialize on the edges. And the edges also has a big variety of water bugs in there. Um, and they like to live in there because um, it's safe. They can hide in there, um, they can hold on to things. Um, like a day like, like last night where it was raining a lot and the water might have been flowing a bit faster, they're a bit safer on the edge, it's slower, slower moving there. Um, or uh, if they're carnivorous, it's a really good spot to hang out because things accidentally fall in that don't know how to swim and make good meal. So that, those are the sorts of places when we go looking. And then it's also really important when we go looking for them that we're paying attention to the different types of vegetation. So there are so many different types of water bugs and they all have different preferences about where they want to live. So we want to make sure that when we're sampling, we're going near our um, um, sedges and rushes and grasses and things like that, um, looking at anything that's floating on top of the water like lily pads, um, but also even algae and, and all that sort of stuff. Logs, front of log, back of the log, on top of the log, rocks all around. They all have different preferences about where exactly they want to be. So we've got, we got to sample from a variety of places. Yeah. What does a mergers plant mean? Um, so so sub submerges when they're obviously underneath, floating is when they're on top, and emergent is, is, would be like your sedges where it's, it's, it's coming out of the water, so it's rooted in the, in the sediment, but it, it then is then, yes, best of both worlds. All right, so what are we going to do in 10 minutes? Um, we're going to do a bit of citizen science. So you, you heard Sandra speaking earlier. Um, I'm a big fan of the iNaturalist app. So if you haven't downloaded it yet, um, I can't believe I'm saying this in the middle of a talk, but please take out your phone <laughs> and start playing with it and download it. It's really, really easy to use once you've set up your account. Just see something that you're interested in identifying, whether you know what it is or not take a photo, upload it, um, put in the closest to what you know it is. If all you know is that it's a beetle, just put a beetle. Um, and it's as, it's as easy as that. Um, and for me, it's really enriched a lot of my experiences, um, you know, just sitting around um, sometimes in a space like this and then all of a sudden you've, you've paid attention and, oh, there's 15 things in the one meter around me. I wasn't even aware that there were so many different things around me. So I love iNaturalist for that. Um, but Another um, app that I'm going to use this morning that you're welcome to download as well, it's the Waterbug Blitz app. And this has been designed by a team. There's, there's specialists in their field in, in the area of, um, of water bugs. I'd say I'm more of a water bug enthusiast um, rather than an expert. Um, but that app actually has some identifying 
um, material on there so that you can figure out what the bugs are and then you can report it to them as well. So they're trying to encourage people all around Australia to be um, going and sampling areas and then telling them what, what you found. Because what's really cool about these water bugs is that because there's a huge variety of them and they all have um, different preferences on where they want to live, um, they all also have a variety of sensitivity to pollution, which is really cool. So that, that means that there's some clever people who have actually given each water bug a score based on its sensitivity to pollution. So we can go out, we can take a sample, we can identify what's there, and then we can um, do some very simple maths, or the app will do it for you, and you can work out, uh, through calculation, you can work out a score, and it will tell you how healthy your, your waterway is, which is pretty amazing. Um, and you don't have to spend very much time at all to start to get a bit of an idea of how to identify the water bugs. So you don't have to be an expert to do this. You can, you can do this in, um, as part of a community group, as part of a school. It's not even a huge investment as a family to grab some nets and trays and, and go out and do this yourself. It's so much fun. So I've just mentioned why we look at them. They're basically what we call bioindicators. So they give you an idea of how healthy a waterway is. Um, and the benefit is, so we've done it a few times here in that pond, and that's, that's a huge benefit to be able to go back to the same spot over and over again. Um, and then it will give you an idea of what's happening over time. Um, and it's also a good thing because like all living things, they have breeding cycles. So you have times of the year when there's more of them and more variety. Um, and other times of the year when there's less of them around. So it's always good to be coming back and repeating. Um, and yeah, so you're not just doing one sample and then thinking, oh, geez, this is really poor quality. You might have just gone at the wrong time of year. They're also really important because they, they, they don't just give an indicator of how clean the waterway is. They actually help to improve water quality. So a lot of water bugs um, eat um, plant matter and decaying plant material as well, or they might eat, um, uh, yeah, basically they eat things that are, that are decaying. So they're helping to, to clean all that stuff out of the water. They're helping to process and break down nutrients, helping to keep it clear. So they have, they have a very important role in that way. Um, and they're also pretty much the bottom of the food chain. So they're a really important food source for other things. There's a bunch of reasons why we look at them. So, what do we need to do this? You need a net. So this is a specialised net, which you don't have to go out and get. It makes things a little bit easier. Um, so this is a really fine mesh, mesh net um, because a lot of the water bugs that we're looking at are very, very small. So you don't want them to be able to escape. You can just go out to your local pool shop and get uh, an aquarium or a fish tank net or something like that, um, not your pool shop, sorry, your pet shop, and get um, uh, a fish tank net. That would be fine. You won't be able to get everything, but you should be able to still get enough to, um, to see what's in the water. Um, something like this is probably going to cost over $100, whereas the net at the shop is, is super cheap and you know, is, is good enough for having some fun at home. Um, you need something to keep your feet dry gumboots, waders, something like that, or just be willing to get your feet wet. White trays, super important. Um, and you'll see when you come out um, and have a look at the bugs, how it makes such a big difference. These things are so small. Um, you need like a white opaque, like the chairs, something like that. Um, so not, not clear or red or anything like that. Um, probably, yeah, probably that's the thing that's gonna make the biggest difference. And there are so many free identification guides on, online. The Waterbug um, Blitz app that I mentioned is just one of them. Um, but you just all you have to do is Google Waterbug Identification Guide and you have so more resources than you know what to do with. Um, and a freshwater stream. So make sure you're not too close to the sea because they don't like to live in salty areas. Um, but a pond, um, I've even done it in stormwater drains, um, as long as you're mindful of washing your hands afterwards, is they're just, they're just almost everywhere. I won't go into too much detail about the um, collection technique so that we can get out there, but what I might do is show you a video. So this is one of the free resources that you can find online. This was created by, um, will I get some sound with this, Sandra?
That's it. Yeah. Got it? All right. Well, you have to go to the settings. To get that. All right. Well, my, we might have sound later yes, on then. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll just, if I can't get it to work quickly, then we won't worry about it. So some important things to remember um, when we're down, um, sorry, up at the pond, um, we need to be really gentle. So these are very, very small creatures. Often they have really fine legs and gills and things that they absolutely rely on having for survival, same as you need your arms and legs, so do they. Um, so we want to be really gentle with them. Uh, luckily, we're not going to have too much trouble with the heat today, but they are very heat sensitive. And when, if you're ever doing this on your own, if you've just got them in a little bit of shallow water and you've got them in the sun, that's going to heat up very quickly and very soon you will not have live bugs anymore. Um, so keep them cool and always put them back where you found them. They're, like I said, they're very, very important, so we don't want to be pulling them out of the, um, of the environment. We want to make sure that they're returning and, and staying on to live their lives. Um, so you're all coming out? Lots of enthusiasm. Yes, you have a question or? No? All right, awesome. I can't wait. So I've got, I've got the trays and everything all set up. So, so if you're worried about that it's raining and all that sort of stuff, it's all set up um, undercover up there. I'll be the one who's getting all wet um, and dirty if you're really keen to get involved. You're more than welcome to, um, or you can just have a look at the bugs um, undercover. 